So since we are ahead of schedule, Charlie, if you want to spend a little extra time because you have a lot of detail, you're, we you're welcome to do so, all right? Great. So I'll keep it 45, but you might be able to go to 50, all right? Okay. Very good. Uh, great. Um, so, so hopefully that'll be a good thing for all of you as well. <laughs> Um, so thanks for being here. Uh, this is my first NANOG, so I'm excited to have the opportunity to get to uh, uh, talk to all of you. And um, I get to work a lot with open source and with uh, standards as part of my, my day job. And um, so I'm here to talk to you today about Open Daylight, which is one of my favorite open source projects, and how thanks to support for um, standards that exist in the uh, network programmability space around data models and network management protocols, uh, you're able to use Open Daylight as a great platform for network programmability. So here's the agenda. We'll start by just doing a level set very briefly about what SDN is and then what Open Daylight is. I'll spend a bit more time then talking about network programmability, uh, standards that exist in that space, how you would use them, uh, why you should care. Uh, then we'll get a little bit more practical, I guess, on the approach and uh, look at how you would uh, install Open Daylight and configure it to um, support the network programmability features on it um, that I think are of, of, would be of interest to you. And then a, a, an SDN controller isn't very useful if it's not attached to any kind of network elements. So we'll look at various network elements show how you can um, have Open Daylight connect to them and uh, then use Open Daylight to interact with those network elements. And then we'll wrap up with, with some conclusions. Okay, so uh, what is SDN? I think some other folks uh, have already um, given better definitions probably than what I have here on this slide. But uh, you know the, the concept's been around for a while. Um, I think the key things that jumped out at me when people first started talking about SDN, uh, software defined networking, was, well, we really want to be able to separate the control plane from the data plane. Not only separate them, but then take advantage of the fact that we could actually um, logically centralize the control plane while leaving the, the data plane disaggregated uh, across the space that we're, we're trying to serve. Um, OpenFlow came into existence then as a protocol that could be used from the control plane to, uh, to program the data plane. And, and um, white label switches also as a way to make that data plane uh, hopefully less expensive and, and just easier to manage and, and, and deal with over time. So those are all valid and useful aspects of SDN. However, what to me is the most important aspect that came out of SDN is the programmability aspect. If you think about the network, and many of you here operate networks, you know there's a vast amount of information in the network. Uh, the traffic that's flowing through it, all the flows that are there. If you are able to uh, provide access to that information, uh, harness that information, make it accessible to network aware applications, um, there's a lot they could do on that, whether it's a big data type of analysis, whether it's monitoring very specifically for something that uh, is important to an, a certain application that's running on the network. You're able to um, infer some things from what the network tells you is going on, and not just to configure it, but to look at the actual operational information that's there, and then perhaps reconfigure it or change it or modify the configuration of the network to, to better suit your needs. And to me, that network programmability uh, that comes along with SDN is, is the really valuable part, the most valuable part. Just putting this to a picture, you can see still have this uh, separation of the control plane and the forwarding plane that, that we said is a key component. But then down there at the transport level, that's where all this information resides that I was referring to, all that the network knows about. And so being able to expose that to uh, applications that sit above the network, above a, a controller, and uh, allow those applications to have access to that information, and then make some intelligent decisions and perhaps reprogram the network based on what they've learned. That's kind of the, the closed loop that uh, network programmability and SDN allows that we want to take advantage of. So with that in mind, uh, what is it that we really need then from an SDN controller? I mean, obviously, it needs to be able to provide the network functionality to control our network, but 
you know, what else do we need? And we really want it to be a platform on which we can deploy these types of applications, these network aware applications that I was talking about in the previous picture. And in order to facilitate that, uh, we need these developer-friendly APIs. We want to make it easy for people to come and uh, not, not just have the information there in some obscure format, uh, but actually make it have clear, well-defined APIs that make it easy to access this information. At the same time, we don't want to worry about a lot of application developers won't have the, the breadth of knowledge that you all have about the nitty-gritty details of networking. So you want to be able to abstract away as much as you can um, about various aspects of the network, the topology, the, um, the various protocols that you're using. So that's really the, the key features that we want from an SDN controller. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at Open Daylight. So as I mentioned, Open Daylight, it, it's an open source project, um, basically acts as an SDN controller. This chart's a bit hard to read probably, but uh, don't get too hung up on the details. Uh, in the middle part, in the blue and red, what I'm showing there, it's, this is the, the base network functionality, enhanced networking capabilities, network abstractions. These are just table stakes for any SDN controller. You're gonna find these in any SDN controller. Um, Open Daylight provides them, provides them in a modular way, the way it's broken into these various boxes here. The idea is you can just enable selectively those pieces which are important to you. Um, now what I think is, is really important here though is that on top of that, uh, Open Daylight provides these uh, developer-friendly APIs. And here's where I'm listing, the, these are RESTful APIs, also things like RESTConf, NetConf. Um, Basically, Open Daylight makes those available to applications that reside above it and allow them to in a, uh, provide a nice abstraction for them to access all the network functionality within the controller and of the underlying uh, network elements that are down there at the bottom. Now, a, a key to allowing this to happen is this serv service abstraction layer. And what that really is, is just a messaging fabric so that um, again, the applications that reside up above don't need to worry about exactly what network elements are down below, exactly what protocols are being used to control them. They have um, clear access to them, and this messaging fabric just enables that communication to, to flow up and down as necessary. And then the last thing I want to point out here is all these different network protocols that Open uh, Daylight provides. Just like you can selectively enable the different features within Open Daylight that you're going to use, you can selectively enable and use the plugins that you want here for various network protocols so that they're supported. On the far left, you see OpenFlow, which is the first protocol that was supported. But fortunately, you see a whole bunch of other ones there as well. Uh, NetConf, which we'll, I'll be talking about later, but also things like BGP and PSAP and, and you, know, you name it. So, um, Whatever network elements you currently have, good chance that there's a plugin that exists for Open Daylight to interact with them. So whenever you consider uh, working with any open source project, I think it's really important to look at the community behind it. And uh, fortunately, uh, Open Daylight has a well-established and, and healthy community behind it. It was founded in 2013 when a number of companies came together and contributed not only a significant amount of code, but more importantly, uh, developers as well to work together with each other to get that into a kind of a cohesive uh, project uh, that you could actually use. They brought it within the Linux Foundation, established it as a project there where it's uh, licensed using uh, the Eclipse public license. And um, the very first release came out in 2014, about a year after this all started. It's called Hydrogen. Next release, came out six to eight months after and kind of continued to a cadence sort of like that. So you had hydrogen, helium, the current release, stable release is nitrogen. Uh, the next release is oxygen. Um, Any of you see a pattern here uh, that the, the releases are named after elements in the periodic table. So uh, anyone know what the next release would be? Lithium. No, lithium we already had. So it'd, it'd be uh, fluorine which I wouldn't have known if I hadn't attended the calls for the release planning. <laughs> so, okay, now 
to talk just very briefly again, and this is a very high level, but, but what is software architecture? The code, is, it's almost all Java. That's a good enterprise grade, you know, uh, cross-platform compatible programming language. We use Maven uh, as the build tool to, to assemble all these components together. Uh, Caraf is something very important here. It basically provides um, an OSGI, um, based, it's based on OSGI, it provides a framework for us to dynamically enable and add components to open daylight. And that's what allows you to add, to just enable those features that you want at runtime, add new features at runtime, add support for a new um, uh, network protocol or for a new Yang model as we'll talk about later on. So when you first install open daylight, it starts up with just kind of this shell with just that uh, abstraction layer that I showed you earlier. And then you can selectively add those features that you want to on top of it. This allows Open Daylight to scale and get as complex as you need to have it be without having all the extra complexity that you, you may not need at all. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears and talk about network programmability. So, you know, why do we care, first of all? Um, how many of you actually operate um, your network operators in here? Okay, so a good number here. So you can keep me honest here, but um, network equipment is expensive, but yet the cost of actually operating that network over time is uh, a far larger cost. Here shown as being about two to one. Um, also, if you think about deploying a new application on your network, especially with uh, cloud computing and, and the way that works today, it's very, very quick to spin up the compute resources that you need for a new application. However, the networking components of that application and yeah, meeting its requirements is uh, a bit more challenging and can take a lot longer. So with network programmability, we're really trying to hit on these two things, to help with the operational uh, cost and to help with um, speed up uh, the networking for deploying new applications. So fortunately, the IETF had given us something, the uh, simple network management protocol. And sounds great, it's, it's simple, it manages our network, um, we're good. So I could just end my talk right there. Um, the problem is, as I'm sure most of you know and, and have experienced, you're not, probably not using it for configuration uh, at all. You may be using it for some fault handling, some monitoring, but it, it's really not a network management uh, protocol at all, and you can't use it for configuration. When it comes to configuration, what almost everyone is doing is using the CLI, and uh, actually maybe doing some really clever things around uh, how you try to automate around the CLI and program to it. However, that's very brittle, right? You end up doing a lot of string manipulation, regex expressions, and uh, you may get something working, but then as soon as a new release comes out or a different vendor's CLI, um, you have a lot of tedious work to maintain that. So we really needed something better, and fortunately, you, uh, as uh, the network operator community, went back to the IETF and let the IETF know loud and clear, hey, we need something better, and, and convinced the IETF that something better had to happen. And so as a result of that, uh, this is what happened. We had some lessons learned from SNMP, places where it actually worked well, but certainly somewhere it didn't. Uh, we saw what was being done with the CLI, some best practices around how that was being used, and really some, some clever usage there. Uh, then also just the operational requirements, take that into consideration, the things that aren't handled well and need to be. And out of that came uh, Yang data modeling, and then NetConf and RESTConf as protocols um, uh, based on uh, using those Yang models. Okay, so first of all, what is Yang? Uh, it's a data modeling language built specifically or defined specifically uh, for networking and for network data. What it's going to do is take you away from that kind of string manipulation, uh, Wild West CLI type of uh, definition of, of, of network data and give you a, a well-defined formal contract of what your, um, your network data looks like. It has things built into it like constraints, reusable types, it's very modular. You can have one Yang model uh, encapsulate another Yang model. Kind of a lot of concepts that I think came out of uh, object-oriented programming are taken advantage um, by, by Yang. And so with that, we now have this formal contract language 
uh, that we can use to capture um, the definition of our network data. Just to give you an idea of what a Yang model looks like, I'm looking at the Yang model uh, network topology here. This is just a, a text editor. And you can see in it at the top, there's a container named network topology. The container is just really a grouping element. Within it, it can hold a list, multiple lists, even other containers. Um, here, there's a list of topologies. And within there, um, each uh, kind of leaf node is an individual uh, topology, and it's denoted by a topology ID, um, each unique element within that list. Now, this, this Yang model scrolls off this page very quickly and is a little bit hard to perhaps work with. It's just a, a basic text file. So fortunately, we have some really good tools around Yang. Uh, PYang is one such tool. It's a CLI-based tool. It allows you to take a Yang model and validate that Yang model. And then also you can, through giving it different um, parameters, you can tell it to output the Yang model in different forms. What I'm showing here on the right-hand side is outputting it, that same network topology model, outputting it as a tree. And that just makes it a lot easier to see the individual elements and structure of the Yang model. Another tool, Yang Explorer, that's more of a kind of a browser-based, uh, a graphical tool that allows you to look at a, a Yang model, similarly see its structure, collapse and expand certain elements and drill down into it. Again, just to make it easier for, um, uh, for humans to process a Yang model. And then Open Daylight, fortunately, has a great set of tools called Yang Tools. And what that allows Open Daylight to do is to interact with Yang models, to actually generate code um, based off those Yang models to support all the APIs that are associated with those Yang models. And we'll take a look at that in a bit more detail here. So just imagine that what I'm showing here, these uh, Yang models in green, imagine those are the Yang models associated with um, some new service or maybe with a network element that you want to bring into your network. And Open Daylight didn't know anything about that before. So you can run this through Yang tools, and this can happen dynamically while Open Daylight's up and running. Um, all the APIs associated with those Yang models, you can generate code to support all those APIs. Through Maven, those can be incorporated into the Open Daylight build. And then using the Caraf framework, you can go and you can enable uh, the features or the capabilities associated with those uh, Yang models. So now Open Daylight is able to support um, the network element that's defined by those Yang models and interact with it. Uh, similarly, um, in addition to just the, you know, the, the actual API associated code of, of handling the request, you may want Open Daylight to do something specific when uh, an API gets invoked. And so here's at the bottom then, that's showing how you could write some of your plugin source code. And again, incorporate that through Maven, load it into Open Daylight using Caraf, and add support for, um, so that it can actually do something useful when these APIs get invoked. Okay, so that was Yang, that showed and how Open Daylight supports it. Now I'm gonna talk very briefly about NetConf. What NetConf is, is it's a, a defined in the ITF as network management protocol that came about wanting to do something better than SNMP. It was originally defined actually before Yang was, uh, so you can see that was RFC uh, 4241, whereas Yang was 6020. So very fortunately, um, NetConf was updated to take advantage of, of Yang. So when I talk about NetConf here and the rest of this talk, I'm primarily talking about this newer version, RFC 6241. It's a connection-oriented protocol, runs over SSH or TLS. Key thing is that the actual, while uh, NetConf provides a set of operations, the, the data, the format of the data within uh, your NetConf request is exactly uh, defined by the Yang models. So that's the well-defined um, syntax then that is used within your NetConf request. You have the ability to differentiate between configuration data and state data, uh, very important there. Your configuration data is gonna be read-write information, whereas your state information is, is read-only. Uh, you're able to deal with that. You're also able to have different data stores. So even, among, even when you think of just your configuration data, you might have a startup configuration, a running configuration, 
or a candidate configuration. And then the last thing I want to point out here, which is uh, very important, is being able to um, group changes and validate that they're actually correct. And then the concept of transactions, so you can apply multiple things at once. And um, you know, if they either all succeed or all fail together and then roll back if they didn't succeed. And, and that's really key because now through NetConf, you actually have the fundamental programming features that you need in order to um, programmatically interact with, with your network. Just showing how this works. NetConf here, it, as I mentioned, it's connection oriented, primarily over SSH. You would just establish a, a, an SSH connection from a NetConf client to a NetConf server. There's a hello exchange, and what happens there is the server telling the client, here are all the Yang models that I support. And now the client knows all of the APIs which are defined by that Yang model that it's able to use um, when talking to this NetConf server. You can use NetConf commands to um, get and edit and do things with configuration or with the operational state, and then when you're done, you close the connection. Okay, so now RESTConf. Uh, that NetConf thing sounded pretty good. Uh, it was certainly a big improvement. Um, why do we need this RESTConf thing, and what is it? One of the things we mentioned that was very important um, for a, a controller is providing developer-friendly APIs. And while NetConf was certainly, or is certainly, a lot more usable than uh, doing a bunch of just string manipulation with the CLI, it is uh, kind of heavyweight. It's uh, really good from like uh, machine to machine, like a controller talking to a network element. It, it's not quite as friendly as what you see with a lot of web application developer APIs. Uh, for example, REST-based APIs are something that's very popular and very to use, easy to use in the application developer community. Um, so what RESTConf does is it takes Yang models and maps the access of them onto RESTful uh, APIs. Think, so now you can use like GET and PUT and POST, use HTTP requests to interact with a Yang model. And in addition to using XML, which is how NetConf encoded uh, the Yang data, it adds support for JSON. And this combination of HTTP requests, RESTful APIs, JSON, those are things that are very comfortable and very familiar to application developers, and there's a lot of tools um, out there in the market that help you interact with them. And we'll look at some of those a little bit later on in this talk. give you an idea of how uh, RESTConf works. Uh, I mentioned that uh, you end up, it, it provides a RESTful API, right? And then you can use like get, put, and post. So the structure of the Yang model actually defines exactly what the REST, uh, what the HTTP URI should look like that um, you use for your REST-based uh, request. In this example, uh, localhost 8181, that's where my instance of open daylight is running. I'm using RESTConf, uh, so you can just see how the URL gets built up here. I've gone back to my favorite example of the network topology um, Yang model, so that goes into the URI. Uh, I'm going to look at the network topology list within that. Now, I mentioned before that we have this read-write data, which is configuration, and operational data, which is read-only. If you can see, I have an RW uh, in the Yang model for this uh, list element here. So that's where the config part comes from. Now I'm going to interact with a specific topology um, within my list here. And the ID of that topology is uh, topology-netconf. Within that, I want to interact with a specific node. And the ID of that node is VPP1. So here you can see the construction of the URI exactly flows from the Yang model. And then the data, which I mentioned could be encoded as XML or as JSON, that's uh, determined by another Yang model that's referenced from this one. And so this NetConf node topology, the information in there and that Yang model gives exactly the syntax and structure of the, um, the data that I would need to uh, encapsulate in my Yang, uh, sorry, in my REST conf request. 
So the important thing that I want to make sure um, I point out here is that it's not a choice of netconf or restconf. It's really a matter of, uh, it's not an either or. You use whatever's better for the job. You could even use both at the same time. The key thing is, whether you're using restconf or, or netconf, you're operating with the exact same data store on the network device or whatever it is you're talking to. So in this example, you can see, you know, using uh, SSH and, and XML encoded netconf request could be interacting with the data store at the same time that um, I could be interacting with it using RESTConf. Um, so you just choose the right one for the job. Okay, now since we're talking about open daylight, I want to show how this all maps onto open daylight. So in this example, what I have is an instance of open daylight. Um, you can see at the bottom there, NetConf is a protocol that I enabled on, um, on open daylight and I'm going to use that to talk to these various uh, network elements. VPP1, VPP2, those are two different uh, switches, and then OpenWRT is a third one. And for the sake of argument, we're saying these all support NetConf, and there's a set of Yang models that each of them supports, which defines how to interact with them. So the first thing that happens is Open Daylight establishes that SSH connection to VPP1, uh, sets up the NetConf uh, session, there's the hello exchange, and so then VPP1 gets added into the uh, node inventory of Open Daylight, and the Yang models, which is the complete set of, uh, you know, defines the network data that VPP1 supports, those get added into Open Daylight's model cache. And all the code that's needed to interact with those APIs gets generated and incorporated into Open Daylight as well. So now Open Daylight's able to um, used NetConf to control VPP1. Okay, next it establishes a connection to VPP2 and adds VPP2 into its inventory. VPT, VPP2, let's just say for the sake of argument, uh, supports the exact same set of Yang models. It's pretty likely if it's the same product and same release of code. Um, so there's nothing new to add into the cache. Now we talked to the OpenWRT, same thing, establish that connection to it, add it into our inventory. It supports some of the same models, but actually some different models as well. So those new models get added into our cache and more code gets generated. So now I can interact with those models as well. So now dynamically, Open Daylight has added on all the functionality it needs in order to be able to work with the APIs associated with the Yang models supported on these network elements. Okay, great. So I'm doing all right on time. So what I'm gonna do now is show you um, if you wanted to go and do some of this yourself, how easy it is to get up and running with Open Daylight as this type of platform. So all you need to do is go to this URL and the slides are all available online so don't worry about copying anything down. Uh, in this demonstration or example, I'll be using the Nitrogen SR1 release. That's the latest stable release of Open Daylight. You can see it, it comes as either a, a tar file or a um, zip. You, you just download one of those. In this case, I took the zip file, I just unzip it, I CD into the directory that's created there, and I type bin carafe, and that brings up Open Daylight. And it says here it started in zero seconds. That was a little bit of an exaggeration. It probably took two seconds, but still very quick. And the reason it's so quick is because it's doing almost nothing. It's just booting up sort of that OSGI-based framework so, through which I can then go and enable those things that I want to enable. And this is what the Open Daylight CLI looks like. So now I need to go and enable the features I want. And the way I can do that, uh, through the CLI, I type feature list to see the long list of all the features that Open Daylight supports. Feature list-i to see those which have already been installed. I can install new features by doing feature install and give it the name of one or more features and I can uninstall features. And so by doing that, I can selectively add those features which are important to me. In my case, there's, here's the feature set that I want. And Deluxe, which I haven't talked about yet, but that's the graphical user interface that ships with Open Daylight. I want to be able to use that. Um, so I install that feature, the Deluxe Core. 
there's um, some capabilities to interact with the Yang-based UI, and I want that as well, so I enable that. RESTConf and NetConf, I've been talking about those. I want to be able to make sure that Open Daylight supports those, so I enable those. Uh, NetConf topology, um, I want to be able to use that functionality. And when I connect via NetConf, I'm going to be connecting via SSH. Um, there's also a TLS uh, connection. I don't need that. So again, just I can tailor my Open Daylight um, instance to support just that feature set that I want. And then feature list dash R, that shows you the list of required features. And what this does is the outputs there at the bottom of the, the screen, it just shows me those list of features that I've actually enabled. If I did feature list dash I, I'd actually see a much larger list. And the reason for that is feature list dash I pulls in all the dependencies as well. Okay, and you're gonna have to bear with me because the idea was to do a, a live demo up here and walk through some of this, but instead I'm gonna use screenshots and um, try to explain to you what would be going on. So uh, what you're seeing here is Deluxe. This is the Open Daylight UI. And what you see on the uh, majority of the screen there in the middle, those are all the Yang models that ship with Open Daylight and that are installed just out of the box when you download it. And I'm using the Yang UI capability within Deluxe here, and what I'm showing and highlighting here is drilling down into, once again, my favorite example, the, the network topology uh, Yang model. And I've gone down a couple steps to where I'm querying for that topology, and what you can see at the bottom is the RESTConf request getting built out by the Yang UI right there at the bottom. You can see it's set to get, and then there's a URI there, which is similar to the one I showed you before on the slide and built out piece by piece. The Yang UI is building this for me. And then I could do send and I could get that configuration, which if I was to do that right now, wouldn't be too interesting because Open Daylight's not talking to anything yet. So in order to make it a bit more interesting, what you need to do is attach Open Daylight to some type of network elements. And I'm gonna show a few examples here. Um, this first one, you can do this. How many of you have used Mininet before? Could use Mininet um, to create a sample network, in my case, spin up a few open flow switches, and um, then connect Open Daylight to that. And this is just a screenshot of what that would look like. Um, I'm not gonna walk through all the details of that during the presentation, because I wanna focus on a different use case. But if you look at the slides, there will be step-by-step -step instructions how to do all this um, in there. So you can go do that um, on your own time. Another example um, is using uh, uh, BGP and PSEP to connect to a Cisco IOS XR router. The reason I wanna show this is I talked about OpenFlow a little bit at the beginning. That's what was being used in the Mininet example. I've been talking about NetConf and RESTConf, but there's a whole bunch of other protocols I mentioned that Open Daylight supports as well. So in this case, I'm actually using BGPLS and PSEB to talk with a Cisco IOX router. And the links are there if you want to go and, and run through uh, uh, doing that on your own. But what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on is talking about another open source project, uh, VPP, stands for Vec Vector Packet Processing, it's a very high performance um, software forwarder and uh, connecting that into open daylight. So out of the box, VPP doesn't support NetConf or RESTConf, but fortunately as part of the FDIO project, which the link is there on the slides, um, there's a honeycomb agent that you can use in combination with VPP. And as shown in the picture here, what that does is that adds a RESTConf and a NetConf interface um, onto VPP. And then there's a very low level API that Honeycomb uses to, uh, to talk to, to VPP. So through this, we can actually start to use NetConf as I showed uh, earlier when I was looking at VPP1 and VPP2 um, to interact with a VPP node. So the step-by-step -step instructions are, are here and again in the slides for each of these seven steps, I have a whole slide that um, shows the, 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 the details of this, and I'll walk through some of it. The idea with my demo was I was gonna show you just on a laptop how you can do all this, and so you could be doing this as well. You can install Open Daylight on your laptop, 
Now, if you want to install VPP with Honeycomb on your laptop, you have to do a few things. First, you need to create a VM. And I show here how you can create a CentOS VM. And in my case, I, I'm using Mininet, uh, not sorry, VirtualBox to load that up and, and on my laptop. Now within this VM, I need to install VPP and I need to install Honeycomb. So I have some links there that will show you how to do that. Then you um, had to clear IP tables, otherwise all NetConf and RESTConf traffic was being blocked by default. So I did that and then I'm able to start VPP and start Honeycomb. And once I do that, now this RESTConf and NetConf um, interface that you see on the top right is being exposed. So, so far so good. Then what I can do is I can connect directly into VPP and I just wanted to show you this. Um, this isn't using NetConf or RESTConf actually, but just show you what the CLI of VPP looks like and I can query it and see what interfaces it has. And you can see it has the, the gigabit ethernet interface and then local zero. Gigabit ethernet is an interface that I created and assigned to DBDK so it could be used in conjunction with uh, VPP. So if you're interested in, if you've heard things about DBDK, it's being used in combination here. I'm not gonna go into the details of that in the interest of time. Okay, and actually I have links here so you can go and add these uh, either physical or virtual interfaces to your VPP node as well. And uh, sorry, you're gonna have to just bear with me since I'm not doing the demo. You're gonna have to imagine what this could look like. And I have some slides that kind of show how it works. So the next thing you can do is you can connect directly through Honeycomb into VPP using, um, using NetConf. And the SSH command is shown here, how you would do that and communicate with, with VPP that way. Um, however, what I think is more interesting is using the higher level, um, some of the tools that are provided around RESTConf and actually using the, um, either through open daylight interacting with VPP or using Postman. How many of you have heard of Postman? Okay, great. So good thing here, uh, you'll see listed here, I have a couple, um, I have a Postman collection that you can download and what that'll do is a lot, um, it, it's built to allow you to interact with uh, VPP from both open daylight as well as from Honeycomb directly. And um, again, I was gonna demonstrate that, but instead we'll walk through the slides and kind of see how that would go. The idea being that um, so far, my Open Daylight instance has all the capabilities installed on it to do NetConf and RESTConf, but there's no underlying network. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go and add VPP into the network topology. And I would use, um, this is illustrating how to use Postman to do that. So you can see um, the URI being built out here. I have a put request. I have the IP address of Open Daylight. This is exactly that same URI that I showed built out on the previous slide earlier in my presentation. And then I can't click on the body uh, here, but just imagine if I did, you would see the XML or the JSON representation of the, um, the data associated with VPP as, as defined by uh, the Yang model. So I click send, and with that, I get a 201 response, which tells me, you know, yay, it got connected. So now um, VPP is connected into my Open Daylight instance. I could then go and do a get uh, request to get the NetConf topology. And I can't scroll down in the slide here, but if I did, what you would see in the response that comes back is a list of all the Yang models that are supported by VPP and then the connection details of VPP, like what its IP address and port are that it's listening on for, for, uh, for RESTConf. Now this is taking you back to the deluxe interface of Open Daylight because I can basically do the exact same thing through Open Daylight, which is pretty cool. Whereas before I drilled down into Open Daylight and I said there was no topology there yet, now I've added VPP. And so what you can see is again, just by clicking on the uh, elements in the Yang model and drilling down, I can get information about, about VPP. You can see the get, hopefully it's, the slides are big enough that you can read it. If not, grab a copy. I'm doing a get, the URI that I built out is there. 
and I can uh, get the information of VPP this way to directly through the um, Yang UI of Deluxe. And at the very bottom, you can see that information being returned. Okay, so I hope you're able to follow along with that and use your imagination a little bit to what the, the demo would have looked like. And um, I'm happy to show you after the, the talk or, or walk through it, I'll be here the rest of the day. But um, for now, let me just leave you with some conclusions. So hopefully with this talk, I've uh, convinced you that there's more to SDN than just OpenFlow. And the real value of SDN is in network programmability. And, and just really encourage you to, to look in that direction and, and see how you can do that to reduce your, your management costs, your management headaches, and, uh, and hopefully bring you some increased speed um, in uh, managing your network. And then Open Daylight is um, it's open source. It's a great platform. Uh, there's the functionality you need on it you can enable to, um, to act as a great platform for building network-aware applications and for just managing network infrastructure in general. OK. Well, that's all I have. I um, have a couple minutes for questions, I think. Hi, um, Bill Norton. I'm curious, is there an undo button kind of mechanism? So if you want to do a system-wide change and only half of them are successful, you can back off? Yeah, uh, within NetConf, you have that concept of transactions and you can also have the concept of validation. So you could have like a candidate config, you can validate it and if it, you know, make sure it works and apply it and if it doesn't, roll it back. That's kind of the idea. That's something that was missing before, but um, through NetConf, you get that. With something like RESTConf, you don't. Uh, it's lighter weight, which is great, but it's just individual request at that point. So, yeah. It's kind of one of the trade-offs of NetConf versus RESTConf. Yes. Hey, Charles. Uh, Jeff Tensir, uh, New Arch Networks. So it's been two years since I touched up on the light. Uh, any plans to implement gRPC southbound? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. The question, uh, any plans to in, in integrate gRPC southbound? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure. It seems like a good idea to me. I don't know why it wouldn't be. Um, that's one of the nice things about Yang is that it can serve as the data modeling language for a variety of protocols. I've talked about NetConf and RESTConf, but you're right, gRPC is another protocol that makes use of Yang. And I don't see any reason why not to add it to Open Daylight. I'm not aware of a project that's underway to do that. Um, but that may just be that I'm not aware of it. I, I wouldn't say that it doesn't exist or that it's not in the works. And it seems like it would make sense. Uh, second question, comparison between different data stores, so comparison of intended state to operational to applied. Is there any work going on to provide kind of easy to implement comparison between those? Uh, comparison like a diff between two different data stores? Yeah. Um, not specifically within Open Daylight. Uh, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure. Um, Thank not you. a tool that I'm aware of, again. I mean, it sounds handy, but yeah. Thanks. One of the great things about Open Daylight is because it is open source. You know, if there's something that's missing, um, the community's there to. Uh, uh, take more contributions, so. And if someone here is more familiar with, with Yang and doing Yang model comparisons and knows of a diff tool, feel free to run up and tell us about it. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll be around the rest of the day. I'm happy to uh, talk with anyone if you have more questions or wanna go through the, the demo or anything. Uh, thanks a lot. Let's give it up for Charlie, great job.